Circular coordinates parameterize points in the plane using an angle and radial length. Keeping the radius fixed and varying the angle, we trace out circular arcs. Keeping the angle fixed and varying the radius, we trace out lines radiating outward from the origin. Varying both simultaneously allows us to trace out arbitrary paths. In a circular coordinate system, a basis vector is defined at each point along a circular arc. These basis vectors are rotations of the standard basis vectors. The unit radial vector r hat is a rotation of the e1 basis vector. The theta hat vector is a rotation of the e2 basis vector. Let's zoom in on these vectors so that we can describe them algebraically. With the radial unit vector r hat at an angle theta from the horizontal, it's clear that it equals e1 cos theta plus e2 sine theta. The tangential unit vector theta hat is at an angle theta from the vertical, so it equals minus 1 sine theta plus e2 cos theta. We could work with this trigonometric form for the circular unit vectors, but we will opt instead to describe these rotated frame vectors using geometric algebra. A geometric algebra is said to be generated from a vector space that has an associated dot product, i.e. a dot product space. Given a dot product space V, spanned by n elements x sub i, the geometric algebra G of V for that space is in fact a vector space where all the elements, called multivectors, are linear combinations of all the possible scalars, vectors, and products of vectors. A geometric algebra has an associative and commutative addition operation and has an associative and distributive, but not necessarily commutative, multiplication operation. The square of any vector products found within a given multivector are subject to the contraction axiom. That is, the square of any vector is the dot product of that vector with itself, i.e. the squared length of that vector. The simplest geometric algebra is that of the Euclidean plane, which is characterized by a pair of orthonormal unit vectors, E1, E2. The contraction axiom implies that e1 squared equals 1, and that e2 squared equals 1. Let's apply the contraction axiom to the vector that lies along the diagonal of the right triangle with faces e1 and e2. The squared length of that diagonal is 2. Let's expand that square, keeping care to maintain order of products. You have e1 squared plus e2 squared plus each of the inner products, e1, e2, and e2, e1. That gives us 2 plus e1, e2, plus e2, e1. We have 2 on each side, which cancels out, leaving 0 equals e1, e2, plus e2, e1. We may rewrite this as e2, e1 equals minus e1, e2. In words, this means that the product of perpendicular unit vectors is anti-commutative. Should we need to change the order of any two perpendicular unit vectors, we must also change the sign. Here's a summary of the unit vector properties that we found for a two-dimensional geometric algebra. Both unit vectors square to one. And the product of two perpendicular unit vectors is anti-commutative. Any two-dimensional bivector is proportional to E1, E2. We designate this as i like the imaginary of complex numbers, since it also happens to square to minus 1. To show this, we write out the square. i squared equals e1 times e2 times e1 times e2. We can change the order of the first vector product, also flipping the sign, then regroup to find e1 times e1 equals 1, leaving us with minus e2 times e2, which is minus 1, as claimed. Now let's look at the products of vectors with i. We need to be careful with order, since i commutes with scalars and bivectors, but not with vectors. In this video, we'll keep vectors on the left in any vector multi vector products. Expanding e1 times i, we have an e1 squared product, which is 1, leaving e2. Now we expand e2 times i. We use the anti-commutative property to flip the order of the last two terms changing the sign, regrouping, we find e2 squared, which is 1, leaving minus e1. We've just seen that right multiplication of e1 by i rotates that to e2, e2 equals e1i. 
further multiplication rotates E2 to E2i, which is minus E1. By superposition, we can rotate any arbitrary vector x by right by 90 degrees by multiplying it on the right by i. We can now express the unit radial and tangential vectors in complex exponential form. Starting with the radial unit vector r hat, we introduce a factor of 1 equals e1 times e2 on the sine term. We can now factor out the leading e1, leaving an e1 e2 factor for the sine. E1, E2 is what we call our i, leaving E1 times cos theta plus i sine theta. That's just the exponential, so we're left with r hat equals E1 times e to the i theta. We can do the same thing for the theta cap vector, this time we're introducing a factor of 1 as E2 squared. We can factor out the E2, leaving E2 times cos theta minus e2 e1 sine theta. Minus e2 e1 is i, so we have e2 times cos theta plus i sine theta, which is just e2 times e to the i theta. We can also show that theta hat is r hat times i. Let's expand that. e1 times e to the i theta times i, but i commutes with e to the i theta. Now we have e1 times i, which is e2, leaving theta hat is e2 times e to the i theta, which is what we expected. We can think of r hat and theta hat as rotations of the original e1, e2 frame as we traverse a circle. We'll now compute the derivative of the radial unit vector. Imagine that we have such a vector at an initial position at angle theta and then displace the angle by delta theta. Let's zoom in on the difference. The difference between these two vectors is tangentially oriented. We can compute the derivative easily from our exponential representation. All of the time dependence is implicit through the angle theta. We bring down a factor of i theta prime. The leading term, e1 e to the i theta, is r hat, leaving us with r hat i theta prime. We have to be careful not to commute i with any vector factors. We call theta prime omega, and recognize that r hat i is theta hat. So we're left with r hat prime equals omega theta hat. Now let's compute the derivative of the tangential unit vector. Imagine this vector at an initial position angled theta, and displace this by an angle delta theta. Let's zoom in on the difference. This time, we see that the difference between the two vectors is inward radial oriented. We write theta hat as r hat i, then take the derivative. This brings down a factor of i theta prime. i squared is minus 1, leaving us with minus r hat theta prime. Again, we write omega as d theta d prime, so we're left with theta hat prime equals minus omega r hat. Now we'll calculate the radial and tangential components of velocity and acceleration. Our position vector is r times r hat, so the velocity is r r hat all prime chain rule expansion of that, and plug in r hat prime equals omega theta hat. Now let's calculate the acceleration. We step back to velocity in terms of r prime and r hat prime. When we expand that, we'll then get a nice binomial distribution of all the second derivative terms. We can then start expanding out our r hat prime and theta hat prime derivatives until we have no r hat prime or theta hat prime derivatives left. Once everything is expanded, we can tidy up grouping terms and apply one final simplification, factoring out derivatives. We're left with the tangential and radial components for the velocity and the acceleration. Let's look at an example of a vector tracing out all the positions along a continuous curve and the velocity and the acceleration at all the lowest points. In general, for an arbitrary parameterized path, both the velocity and the acceleration vectors have r hat and theta hat components. For the velocity, we have just the right superposition of r hat and theta hat components, so that the velocity lies always tangent to the curve. We've derived general formulas for the velocity and acceleration in circular coordinates. With motion constrained to a circular path, our formulas are simplified considerably. Here's an illustration of circular motion with linearly increasing angular frequency. 
you see that the velocity is always tangential. The acceleration has an inward radial and a tangential component. For constant angular frequency, the acceleration is always inward radial. We can pick off the formulas for the magnitude of the scalar velocity and the scalar acceleration. This video was created with Manum. For more content, be sure to like, subscribe, and click the bell. Check out my blog, peteryo.com, for more geometric algebra material, where you can also find a free PDF copy of my book, Geometric Algebra for Electrical Engineers, and detailed latex typeset notes from a number of physics and engineering courses.